delighted to welcome you today uh, on behalf of the um, <coughs> McLean Center for Clinical and Medical Ethics and the Center for Health and the Social Sciences, um, CHESS, and the Buxbaum Institute. Um, Dr. David Meltzer and I welcome you to our lecture in, in the 2019-2020 series uh, on the present and future of the doctor-patient relationship. Uh, it is a special treat uh, to introduce our distinguished speaker today, Dr. Wendy Levinson. Dr. Levinson uh, had been the uh, Chief of General Medicine here at the University of Chicago. Can I give this to you? Yes, I knew what to spill and lost the top. <laughs> um, and, um, and then was chair of the Department of Medicine at the University of Toronto, um, uh, which uh, I believe, but I may be one who believes it, may be the largest uh, Department of Medicine in North America, um, uh, covering a series of hospitals. Um, Dr. Levinson uh, currently is the chair of Choosing Wisely Canada, a campaign that helps physicians and patients engage in conversations about unnecessary tests and unnecessary treatments and procedures. Additionally, Dr. Levinson is the chair and coordinator of Choosing Wisely International, which is a collaborative of the Choosing Wisely campaign that covers 20 countries worldwide. A national and international expert in the field of physician-patient communication, uh, Dr. Levinson studies topics such as the disclosure of medical errors to patients and informed decision-making. Dr. Levinson has led efforts to educate and engage residents and faculty members in patient safety, quality improvement, and stewardship of finite resources. Other major leadership roles that Dr. Levinson has held over the years include serving as the chair of the American Board of Internal Medicine, as president of the Association of Professors of Medicine, and as president of the Society of General Internal Medicine. A renowned innovator in medicine, Dr. Levinson is the lead author of a book, Understanding Medical Professionalism, a book that teaches healthcare students and clinicians how to deliver the highest quality patient care through professionalism in their medical practice. Additionally, Dr. Levinson is the co-author of both the 24th and 25th editions of the Goldman Cecil Textbook of Medicine. I, I grew up with the Cecil Textbook of Medicine, um, which is one of the most prominent and widely used medical texts in the United States. As a result of her remarkable work, outstanding work throughout her career, Dr. Levinson was appointed an officer of the Order of Canada. Uh, I don't know if you know about this award, but this is one of Canada's greatest uh, domestic honors and recognizes a lifetime of outstanding achievement, dedication to the community, and service to the nation. Today, Dr. Levinson's talk is entitled Patient-Centered Care, Past, Present, and Future. Join me, please, in giving a warm welcome to Wendy Thanks, Levinson. Mark. Well, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. I've been in this auditorium uh, many years ago and see some old f friends in the audience and uh, appreciate the invitation, of course, of Mark, who we've many years talked about whether things are really ethical problems or communication problems, and um, we've bantered over these kinds of issues over the years. So I'm very interested to share this talk with you. Actually, I've never given this talk before. You're experimental here for me. Um, and really, um, what I want to do is share a bit based on the literature, but a lot based on just my reflections over time, because it's a history I've seen unfold. And I will really be interested in your reactions to this um, and your perceptions about where we are in being truly patient-centered in the care we deliver at this time and where we're headed in the future. So uh, to begin with, what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about the history of patient-centered care and how it emerged. I want to talk about the progress and the barriers to implementing it and reflect on what patient-centered care might mean in the future. 
So um, these are back in the old days, in the 50s and 60s. Um, that was just for some of you who might remember. That's the time that Chubby Checkers did the twist. Anna Siegler remembered that. Um, it's a time when medicine held a very reductionist view of disease. Disease could be explained by understanding the biology of the problem and the appropriate treatment. Disease could be accounted for from, as deviations from the norm in measurable biologic variables. Issues that were psychological or behavioral were really delegated to the domain of psychiatry and kind of outside medicine. There was really little consideration of the patient's illness experience or the personal and social issues that might contribute to an illness or be a consequence of the illness. And even for patients with cancer, where the emotional issues are critical, the biomedical model led physicians to focus mainly on the biology of the illness, even to the extent that patients were sometimes back then not told that they had a cancer diagnosis because it might be upsetting to them. As one physician put it, medicine should, quote, concentrate on real diseases and not get lost in the psychosocial underbrush. Secondly, there was a, a dominant view that doctor knew best and that the diagnosis and treatment, um, patients were asked to comply, that was the word, with treatment. Patients who didn't uh, do what the doctor suggested were called non-compliant, or perhaps they didn't ever agree with the plan that was put forward, but the doctor wouldn't have known because they didn't really ask the patient's opinion. After all, the doctor was the expert. So that was back in the 50s and 60s. Then I think a really um, paradigm-shifting paper was this paper published in Science by George Engel, um, which introduced the concept of the biopsychosocial model in 1966. So that was back when uh, the, the Eagles did uh, Hotel California. So to provide this really um, paradigm shift was to provide a basis for understanding the determinants of disease and arrive at a rational treatment, a medical model must take into account the patient, the social context in which he or she lives, and the complementary system devised by society to deal with the disruptive effects of the illness. This was the biopsychosocial model. And while the concept of patient-centered care wasn't coined yet, the model really required physicians to understand the patient in the broader way and to explore how the illness might affect their life and their social community. The model was really a major departure from the existing par par paradigm, and I would say that it was not broadly accepted at all in the mainstream of medical practice, um, although there was a movement that George Engel started back in, at that time at the University of Rochester that led to a cadre of faculty who tried to embed some of this in medical education. Some of you may remember that the Society of General Internal Medicine really spawned at that time a group of faculty who tried to teach these concepts in, in medical education. So, um, this really took uh, another step forward, another 10 years later, approximately, in 1988. Um, I won't go on with this forever, but Whitney Houston was doing I Will Always Love You. Um, and in 1988, the Picker Commonwealth Program for Patient-Centered Care actually first coined the term patient-centered care and called attention to the need for clinicians, staff, and healthcare systems to shift their focus away from the diseases and towards a broader approach that gave a more central role to the family and to the patient. By the way, the Pickers were a couple, Jean and Harry Picker. Um, when Jean was diagnosed with a terminal illness in Boston, they thought that the American healthcare system was technologically and scientifically excellent, but quote, not adequately sensitive to the concerns and personal needs of patients, and that this adversely affected the quality of care they received. So remember, that was back in 1988, and the term first came about. And they started, actually, the Pickers, bringing people together to talk about this concept of patient-centered care. And, one, um, and what they learned in their research, uh, which was 
focus groups of patients is that from a patient's perspective back in 1988, quality meant these things, respecting patients' values and needs, integrated care, education for the patient and family, physical comfort, emotional support, involvement of the family and friends, and continuity through transitions of care. Might sound actually modern, right, David Meltzer? Um, some of the things that you are still talking about. But this was the patient's perspective. And you know what's in here is a lot like the biopsychosocial model and what was meant by patient-centered care. And as one patient put it back in 1998, nothing about me without me. Something that I think is just a really interesting, simple way of expressing patients' desire to be central in the care that they receive. So then I think what happened is, in 2001, the Institute of Medicine uh, really helped to put this into focus. Because until then, the term, although it was coined, was not part of the mainstream of practice, education, or research. But I think the, the IOM put it on the map with crossing the quality chasm. In, in the book, the IOM included patient-centered care as one of the six dimensions of quality. Effective, safe, timely, access, equity, and patient-centered. And the IOM defined patient-centered as care that was respectful of and responsive to the individual need, patient's preferences, needs, and values, and ensured that patients' values guided clinical decisions. So obviously, this highlighted the need for, for clinicians and patients to work together to define the goals of care and the possible treatments approaches that were appropriate for that patient's values. It used the term patient experience, highlighting the primacy of the patient role and the, how the healthcare system needed to meet their individual needs better than it did for Mrs. Picker. So obviously, this co co followed closely from the work that the Picker Institute started, but it may not be obvious that it was really a major turning point in the recognition of the importance of this approach and a shift away from a purely biomedical model that clearly this could not have been written 10 years earlier. This was a major step forward. It was a, what I would call a game changer in medicine. So now the stage was set for the challenge of really putting this into practice. And you might think about whether we've made a lot of progress since this which was written in 2001. Because the barriers were pretty significant still, that some doctors and clinicians really still held the view that doctor knew best um, and weren't sure how to incorporate the patient's perspectives. Um, they might have been not convinced that, um, while well, they might think that these issues were important, how, how important were the psychosocial issues compared to the biomedical issues? And I think they asked the obvious question, well, does it really matter to patient outcomes? Is this really a model that improves the care of diabetes or hypertension or all the diseases that we see so frequently? I think some people asked, can you do this new model of care without it taking so much time in short visits? And there were very few tools to facilitate this kind of patient-centered communication. So I think there were you know, pretty significant barriers. But over the next decade, research on patient-centered care, communication between clinicians and patients, and the relationship to outcomes started to build the case of the importance of this model of care. Given the definition of patient-centered care, implementing it, defends, de it depends on effective communication because understanding preferences and needs requires skills in exploring these issues. And articles not previously in the medical literature started to appear, focusing on particular kinds of communication, like breaking bad news or disclosing medical errors. They were kind of a way of talking about patient-centered care, but in a more specific way. And people started to measure patients' experience, in some cases providing feedback to clinicians. So I think things the, the model started to look like this. 
that an, an informed and activated patient or family working in a health system that was well organized led to patient-centered clinician communication, which improved communication and improved health outcomes. And so um, the model started to look like this. And since patients with cancer particularly needed to make choices about trade-offs, weighing the pros and cons of particular treatments, I think the field of oncology started first to incorporate this new model. And training programs um, in oncology started to teach uh, patient-centered care. So, Articles started to emerge, and you know, forgive me if I talk a little bit about my own research, but this is one of the parts of history that I, uh, I knew well, um, because I was interested in physician-patient communication really from very early on in my career. Um, I had actually trained a bit with uh, people who had trained with George Engel, and so this was sort of part of um, my view of the world. And along with some of my colleagues, we wanted to do research to engage physicians who didn't really believe this was important in the field. Um, you know, it was nice to try and improve patient satisfaction or patient experience, but a lot of physicians weren't so actually, frankly, interested in those outcomes. And so we thought we would try to take an outcome that doctors did care about, which is whether they were sued or not, and, um, and link it to communication. I always said I tried to teach patient-centered communication in a physician-centered fashion. And so we, we did this study, and it was um, really an interesting study in which we audio taped um, orthopedic surgeons with their patients and primary care doctors with their patients out in, in the community. We did 10 audio tapes per, um, per doctor. And we analyzed the communication between doctors and patients. And these are not the patients that sued them. Half of the doctors had been sued at least twice or more, and half had never been sued. And we tried to analyze which had been sued and which hadn't based on the communication we heard. And what was interesting is that we were able to predict far above chance um, who had been sued, partly by the content of the communication, but also by the tone of voice of the doctors. Um, I worked with someone at Harvard who whited out the words and just had tone of voice that you could hear, and they would rate that. And we were able to listen and predict in, in models who had been sued and who hadn't. And this work actually is still my most cited work, largely because it was uh, written about in Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink. Um, so, you know, this is the kind of work that started to emerge to make the link between communication and outcomes people cared about. In, in this work, which Clarence Braddock did using um, some of the tapes, we looked at um, the process of informed decision making. And many authors, including people in medical ethics, have proposed what elements of communication are most important to good decision making. So using these tapes, we found that many of these elements were lacking, um, even in patients that were seeing surgeons for consideration of complex surgeries. Um, what we found is the surgeons were very good at providing a lot of information about the, te the technique that would be used in surgery, actually too much information for patients with lots of jargon, but they rarely explored patient preferences and asked what they valued. In fact, what we found is that the patients were much more likely to tell research assistants what they were really thinking about whether they wanted to have the surgery or not, like, I'm worried about this surgery because I take care of my elderly husband, and if I'm in the hospital, who will take care of him? They would tell research assistants, but we knew from listening to the tapes that they had never told the doctors. Um, so Peter Eubel, in more recent work, 20 years later, actually on shared decision making, found kind of the exact same thing. He studied surgeons and audio taped them who were talking about prostate cancer diagnosis and treatment options, clearly one where there are a lot of views about what's right for an individual. And he found, like ours, that surgeons often provided a lot of technical information but rarely explored patient values. And in both his work and ours, we found that physicians rarely commented on patients' emotional reactions or concerns. In, in short, um, 
there was a long way to go between informed, really what we meant by informed decision making in theory and what was happening in practice. And so what happened is then I think people started to develop tools to make informed decision making a little more uh, easier to do. So I don't know how many of you use shared decision making tools in practice, but this is an example of a very good one created by the Canadian Preventive Task Force to talk about women who are considering being screened for a mammography in their 40s. And what you can see is that if a thousand women are screened, those are all the boxes, those, the women in gray will have a normal mammogram and be reassured. But everybody in blue and purple will have a false positive and many of them will have an unnecessary biopsy. And you can see that less than one breast cancer death will be prevented. That's half of the green person in the corner. So now if you want to have a conversation with a woman about ma whether she wants a mammogram, if you show a person this diagram and discuss it with them, it's a completely different kind of conversation in which a woman, woman could talk about what she values and does she care if she's one of these blue or purple women? Will she be anxious if she has a false positive? This is the kind of tool that makes the real choice um, very different than us saying, well, we don't really recommend it or we do recommend it. It puts it into a shared, a framework that can allow a true sharing based on patients' values. So these kind of tools actually um, are pretty hard to come by for a variety of reasons. They're hard to make, they're hard to keep up to date. And in fact, a lot of them that used to be around are now behind paywalls, so they're hard to access. But Cochrane has done a variety of, of studies. They looked at you know, 115 trials and found overall that when patients did have decision aids to help in decision making, they had very positive outcomes, greater knowledge, more accurate risk perceptions, because you can see on that diagram where you would have a more accurate risk perception, greater comfort with decisions and engagement in decisions. And what's, of course, interesting is, as you probably know, that if people do use these tools, they're much less likely to take aggressive pathways, like to have prostate surgery or uh, aggressive surgeries, because they understand the risks and benefits a lot more fully. So there started to be, um, you know, a body of literature that talked about benefits of shared decision making. Um, but I think also what happened then is it was clear that the relationship between patient-centered care and outcomes was sort of more complicated than I think earlier research put forward. Um, and in this diagram, what you see is that if there's communication that happens between providers and patients, like information expand and responding to emotions, how does it lead to health outcomes? Well, it could directly affect it, um, like emotional well-being might be um, immediate, you know, directly affected by responding to patients' emotions, but it could go through indirect pathways of you know, greater trust, and greater trust then might build greater sort of self-care skills or emotional management. So the relationships between how you got from patient-centered care to better outcomes, people started to understand was more complex. And I think one of the reasons the literature is difficult is that we haven't had a really clear model of how the, what the flow is between better patient-centered communication and outcomes. And so this article, was rich, which was written in 2009, tried to articulate that in a way that research could then hang its hat on a different kind of framework. But overall, I would say that the work that has tried to study the relationship between patient-centered care and outcomes has been pretty inconsistent in its findings. Um, partly because the, the, com the complexity of it, partly because the way of assessing communication and whether it's patient-centered is not standardized. Some people use audio tapes or try to use videotapes or self-reports. And so, as you can see, um, these behaviors are not as directly linked to outcomes as makes it easy to study. Um, so I think overall, um, it's still a work in progress, understanding the relationships to biologic outcomes. 
Um, there is a fair amount of evidence, though, that patient-centered care makes patients more knowledgeable, activates them to be more engaged, in some cases improves management of chronic disease, particularly hypertension and diabetes. It, it li is being linked to decreasing malpractice risk, and so it's still, like I said, a work in progress. So I think another driver that has led to increased attention to patient-centered care is the feedback that we, in many hospitals and clinics, now receive. The, this the CAP survey started to be commonplace. Uh, this is the national one. And you know, it asks questions like, in the last six months, how often did your provider explain things in a way you could easily understand, listen carefully to you, show respect for the, what you had to say, and spend enough time with you? And in general, the three biggest complaints of patients are that clinicians didn't listen to their concerns adequately, that they didn't provide enough information, and that they didn't spend enough time. So gradually, providers started to get feedback on how they were rated by patients in comparison to their colleagues, and there's nothing like some healthy competition to get physicians to want to improve. So this clearly signaled that healthcare systems cared about the patient experience. So in sum, over the decade after the IOM report, patient-centered care became more of a mainstream in, in our language. It was broadly agreed that it was part of quality of care. It became less about convincing clinicians that it was important and more about the skills of doing it and in short visits. So this is a long way to get to the present, um, but I'll be shorter in the, uh, the present and the future, and you might think about where we are now in our transitions. So the present, I'd say, is uh, dominated by the major force of the internet and the use of electronic medical record. The impact on, by the way, this, pay, this is University of Chicago and Toronto. I just thought they looked the same. <laughs> so I left, but you know, still the same. So um, the impact of the electronic med medical record and internet has just been profound in a way that I think all of you know because you live it and breathe it. And it's impossible to cover the topic of how it's affected patient-centered communication um, in a short time. I mean, there are thousands of articles on it. But they, they basically fall into several categories. The internet-informed patient, the impact of the EMR during the visit, communication with physicians through email and texting, and chart notes being available to patients. So I'll start by telling you a quick story. Um, I have a cousin in Boston um, who, who's the husband of my first cousin, and he's 70 years old. He's a retired computer engineer, and he's very adept at computer technology. I'd say he was a, you know, an early adopter of anything that was technologic, but he's the most passive patient I've ever met, driving his doctors and his wife completely crazy. And unfortunately for him, he has many major healthcare problems. He's had a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, treated with toxic drugs, temporal arteritis, treated with high-dose prednisone, high and toxic side effects, and more recently, he has idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So if anyone needs to be an activated patient involved in their healthcare decision making, he does. And in the, the last 10 years, his approach to life has completely changed. He searches the, the internet for information, he looks at all these drugs for his chronic lung decision, physician condition, he emails his physicians, his PCP and his, his main pulmonary specialist, and he gets his chart notes the day they're released online and sends them to me and talks to me in the evening about what they showed. He is, what the literature would say, an empowered patient. And this is entirely a change for him based on technology because before that, he never asked a single question and didn't have access to information. So I think you know there have been zillions of jokes about the internet um, I'm already diagnosed myself, I'm only here for a second opinion. Because in fact, you know, patients like John have become more engaged and, and it's shifted the role 
of the physician from a source of information to a navigator of information who helps a patient take the information that they've found and think it through what it means for them. Like combine the information that they found on the internet, the information that the doctor has, and help think how to make sense of this based on the patient's values and preferences. So helping make patients make choices informed by the evidence with the physician acting as an interpreter. And I'd say it's a task that's easier said than done and challenges physicians, again, about how to do this in really short visits. And then there's the effect of the electronic medical record on in the exam room. And this is an article that Vinny, I don't think, is here, but she's the senior author on the paper, Vinny Aurora. And there have been a number of systematic reviews. Um, in this author, in this uh, article, there were 53 studies that um, in, were included by uh, virtue of using video or direct observation of behavior, behaviors in the visit and surveys to examine patient perceptions. And in general, these studies find that there are some negative aspects largely related to physicians dividing their attention between the screen and the patient, pausing in conversations to attend to the screen, but there are also specific behaviors that facilitate patient-centered interaction by inviting the patient to look at the screen and encouraging patients to um, ask questions and clarify electronic medical information. But skills of attending to the patient's nonverbal communication, despite looking at the chart, are really important. And in general, the literature shows that patients you know, report no significant change in satisfaction with the, the um, encounter as a result of the EMR, but it's certainly a challenge for, for physicians to figure out how to attend to the patient, watch the patient, see their emotional reactions, and at the same time be integrating using the electronic chart. Um, so it's also had a profound, I think, impact on the relationship. And then there's what uh, people do with Mark all the time. They text or call him no matter when. And you know, this is, um, I mean, I really think what could be more patient-centered than this? You know, being able to avoid missing work, having childcare costs, um, having to park and pay for parking, if you can just ask your clinician some quick questions. I mean, I personally almost never see my primary care doctor, but I do email him from time to time. And I'm very impressed with my cousin John and how much his clinicians are responsive to this kind of communication outside of the doctor-patient uh, visit. Um, I think it's really been, um, again, a game changer in how, um, how patient-centered care is delivered. In fact, I noticed when I was um, in the Mark, you're in your offices or maybe in general medicine, a big poster about how trainees like to text. Of course, the downside is, you know, confidentiality issues, but I think it's uh, really had a fairly major impact. And, um, and then I think the, the other great changer has been this major change in patients being able to look at their record. Um, I think it's a great advance. And it really fits with what that patient said years ago, nothing about me without me. Because you know, physicians have been concerned that, um, that having patients read their chart notes would be complicated, um, reveal information that might be uncomfortable, that they might have to chart in a different way. But I think for patients, it's been a huge positive. And um, studies show that physicians' worries about chart notes haven't really borne out. Um, it really is the patient chart, after all. And so I think that this is another really important force that's changing the relationship. So I'm only touching on a few elements of where I think the internet and EMRs have had a profound and mostly very positive effect on the doctor-patient relationship. But um, how to incorporate this in a time-efficient way, all these new technologies, I think is challenging and I'd be really interested to hear your view of how they're affecting our ability to deliver patient-centered care. So um, 
I, I want to also talk about one other force. I said earlier in the, the discussion that sometimes um, uh, specific kinds of communication have highlighted the need to be more patient-centered. And I think one of the things that's happening now relates to um, the discussion about high-value care and tests which may be unnecessary. And so this is just sharing a little bit of the kind of communication work I'm presently doing through Choosing Wisely, which you see is in English and French in Canada. Um, Choisir avec soin is a really nice name because in French it's a double entendre. It also means uh, choosing with caring. So um, that was the name that the, our French colleagues came up with. But why I wanted to show it to you is because I think in Canada, where the campaign has had quite a bit of resonance, um, it, it is a little bit changing the conversation between doctors and patients um, because we're trying to teach the concept to patients that more is not always better and facilitate the conversation about do I really need this test or treatment? And we decided that it was a complicated kind of conversation to have with patients, so we wanted simple imagery to help us. Um, you know, we, we, we know that patients often think that more medicine is better when in fact unnecessary care has risks and costs. They think that screening and early diagnosis is always good when really overdiagnosis can be harmful. Um, we know that they think benefits of treatment outweigh harms when really we're talking about marginal benefits and, and improvements. Um, they often think that denying treatment is rationing, um, but we think it's rational. And they often still defer to doctors when really it's about shared decision making. And so we thought, well, how can we take these kinds of complicated concepts and make them simple? And, and this is what we do. Um, we have a big campaign in Canada that to teach that more is not always better. Um, and this hot dog, which sound, looks just completely disgusting, um, this poster is in almost every family doctor's office in Canada. Um, we have we sent this out to the 31,000 family doctors, and um, it, it's there. Here's another image we use, um, and uh, and the, just to say that Mark mentioned that choosing wisely is spread kind of internationally. So here's what Norway does: they have posters of this, which translate into more is not always better. Um, so you know, um, we also have these questions, which you know the ABIM. Foundation help, who created Choosing Wisely put together these questions. And in Canada, we actually just use the first four because how much it costs is not relevant to us. And we have a poster that also, like this, has been sent out to all the family doctors in Canada and is in many family physicians' office waiting rooms and in their exam rooms. To the best of my knowledge, there's not been research to study whether this helps to create a more patient-centered interaction, except in Australia, where they have very similar questions. Uh, they use three questions about options, benefits, and harms, and how likely these things are to occur. And there have been some interesting studies using unannounced standardized patients in family medicine, where the intervention arm had the patients ask these questions, and the, the, uh, the other arm did not ask the questions. And the study showed um, much increased and improved information given by family doctors and increased patient involvement um, in making decisions. So I think this is an example where a specific kind of, converse, of communication, it, um, in this case reducing unnecessary care, is having the side effect of leading to more patient-centered um, communication. But I would ask you overall to think, before I talk about the future briefly, you know, how you think we're doing in being patient-centered, not just in academic medical centers, but beyond in the community in the US in general. So I think um, the next big change, which I think is not fully here yet um, in the future, relates to AI and the transformation of our understanding of patients' illnesses based not only on their genetic information, but the role of many other factors, psychological, social, and environmental. And in the, in the years that come, I think 
the, the concept of the reductionistic view of disease is just completely different now with our deeper understanding. And I want to show you something I really like that I found on the internet, um, actually from Catherine Lucy, who's at UCSF, about the, breast, the model of what causes might lead to breast cancer um, in a visual way. I want to show this to you. Now, let's see. Because this is, um, so this is a model of all the factors, and so you can think about the biopsychosocial model kind of on steroids that, that lead to breast cancer causation. And as you look at this, you might think, well, what is the role of the physician and the healthcare team in this? Because here are the biologic relationships and factors which influence breast cancer. So all the genetics and the you know, age of menarche and things that we've thought about for many years. But here are the behavioral issues that influence breast cancer. Um, physical activity, BMI, alcohol, age of first birth and parity. Here are the social factors, race and ethnicity, income, um, and here are the physical factors that also influence rate, you know, sleep disturbance, environment, uh, environmental tobacco. And all of these, um, in this model, the thicker the line, the stronger the relationship. But when you look at this, you kind of think, wow, this is very far away from our original model of biomedicine. And it's, it's an incredibly rich model of the biopsychosocial extended model, and it does make you, the authors of this said that, quote, often scientists look at just one factor at a time when they investigate the causes of breast cancer, but in reality, many factors need to be considered at the same time. The model demonstrates the complexity of this disease, uh, and it makes you think about how we not only care for the patient, but prevent disease in the future. Um, let me escape back. Oops, I want to go back to my slides. You want to grab that for me? I just want to show you one other model. Yeah, thank you. Great, that's it. So this is another one, just to show you another example of childhood obesity and adult metabolic syndrome. And you know, I think we, it, you know, it's not just the biomedical factors. Now we understand more about the gut and the microbiomes in the gut. There's things about C-sections and how they affect the, the microbiome environment. There's a lot of information about early exposure to childhood violence. There are factors of intrauterine growth retardation um, and uh, things which happen in, in, in uterine and even early childhood education. I mean, again, the complexity of um, thinking about what this disease is really due to and how we can intervene to prevent it. So I think that, you know, looking at all these factors, you can ask yourself the question, what does it mean to care for a patient thinking of the population of patients um, and the forces that can affect disease? Um, George Engel on steroids. So lastly, you know, I kind of think about the future and AI, by which I mean not machine learning, natural learning, um, language learning, expert systems of decision making, and what its impact is going to be on the physician-patient relationship in the future. And while I'm sure, like Toronto, this is probably a huge area of interest, I put it in the future category because I think we're really just at the early stages of understanding the implications of AI for clinical care. But the, the capabilities of AI um, to care will undoubtedly bring um, precision to many medical problems, allowing us to tailor care to the individual patient. Um, it will likely increase our diagnostic acumen by allowing us to incorporate so many factors that our human brains couldn't synthesize at one point, at one time. Um, it'll again change, I think, the role of what a physician is to become more of an interpreter of complex information, putting it in a context and helping patients make decisions. It will require 
really uh, complex skills of communication like we've discussed before. But it could help us perhaps understand the complexities of that patient with breast cancer or metabolic syndrome by pulling together things from so many domains that into uh, a synthesis for that individual. Um, Abraham Verghese recently wrote in JAMA that systems that augment, um, the article was called uh, Humanizing AI, systems that augment, augment the diagnostic and scientific task of treating disease are exciting and wonderful, but is it possible to invent and discover applications that can enhance the human capabilities in clinicians to better engage in caring for the patient? At its core, medicine will always be enacted through the relationship between the clinician and patient, where the caring and compassion for a human being who is concerned, who is concerned and suffering. Abraham Verghese asks whether these AI technologies might help clinicians provide more humanistic care, because at its heart, medicine, past, present, and future, is based on being patient-centered, or as Francis Peabody said in 1925, the secret of caring for the patient, the secret of the care of the patient is in caring for the patient. And that was in 1925 when, yes sir, that's my baby, just came out. So I'm gonna stop there and I'm very interested in your reactions. I'm curious about your views of where we are in being patient-centered. And uh, I just welcome your questions. David. I'll start with It's great to have you back. I really enjoyed the talk. My, the question I've been sitting here wanting to ask is exactly related to your last slide. And when you began, you talked about sort of 1950s, this, this era when sort of physicians knew best and technology was everything. And you described that as the starting point. But I think the Peabody quote, they're very similar quotes from Osler, and I'm sure if you go back to the Greeks, you can find the same thing. There's a very long tradition in medicine of the emphasis on knowing the patient. And I wonder a little bit whether, in fact, that history is, in fact, much more dominant even now than might be recognized by the perspective one sees sitting in an academic medical I can't help but think of the Pickers being in um, Boston, a place that probably epitomizes that view of what American medicine is. Um, Toronto reminds me very much of Boston in, in that regard. And I, I, I guess I'm curious whether we know much about what medical practice looks like outside of those walls, and, and whether, in fact, what we see in academic medical centers is really representative of what we see in all of us. Not that there isn't truth in learning from that, but that there's probably some, perhaps, broader um, um, human-centeredness in sort of uh, community practice that perhaps isn't present mm -hmm. in the world. Well, I, I would just say from my own experience, the most meaningful relate work in medicine with patients was the longitudinal work with patients over time. I mean, the, being in primary care or in geriatrics, where you work with people that you get to know over a long period of time, and you understand some of their context and their values and preferences, it's a very rewarding kind of work. I think it's rewarding to the, the clinicians in addition to the physicians. But, I mean, I don't know, do you think I mean, I think as time pressures have gotten huge and um, technology has gotten better, bigger, and you know, we we've sort of replaced some of that with technology. I think. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I'll just share the experience we've had developing CCP and working with some of the doctors at Ingalls Community Hospital. I, we see doctors who still practice this way, and not a small number of them, a meaningful number. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I don't dispute the art of change. Um, but but I, I think there might be quite a lot learned by looking at variation. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's a good point. And maybe community hospitals have stayed 
more true to some of that. Marshall? And yeah, yeah, thanks, Wendy, for the great trip down memory lane, both history-wise as well as your, your work. So I, I'd argue that like, education of, of clinicians in communication and the relationship is a necessary prerequisite, but insufficient for there to be the actual change in practice. And you raise issues of, for example, the system and the structural design of, of, of healthcare clinics and, and whatnot, and staffing, uh, and the economics. And so part of it's an issue of like truly society feeling this is an important thing that they're going to basically support it and demand it. And so what ways do you see forward in terms of both the structural and economic support for this type of care? And do you see a way forward that we can go from where we are now to this actually being the reality of what's valued? Well, it's interesting. I mean, you know, I think medical schools used to not teach it, right? And now I think medical schools do teach communication skills as part of their curriculum. But, you know, I think we're still not there yet in our residency training and in practice. I mean, I, I have one other slide. Um, medical schools need to revise the ethics and humanis humanity aspects of their curriculum. So when do you think that was written? This is a newspaper article. It was written last week in the, le of the leading Canadian paper. And I thought to myself, whoa, this is making it into a leading Canadian newspaper. I, I would have thought it was 35 years ago. So I guess in answer to your question, like I think we, we've integrated into residency, uh, into medical education for medical students. In some residencies it's taught, but in some residencies I don't think it's taught or modeled at all. I think we still teach a very medical model <laughs> dominant. If, if you showed that breast cancer model to most oncologists, I don't think they would be thinking about all the factors that lead to breast cancer. I think we're far away from it, really. Mark? Uh, I have um, three related questions. Uh-oh, three. <laughs> Mindy has her hand up, too, Mark. <laughs> what, what aspects of the doctor-patient relationship do you think are timeless and enduring, and which are likely to change with time and with increased technology? The second question, which relates to the first, is what do you see as the biggest challenges of the increase in technology? And the third one is what are the great opportunities from increasing technology? Well, I think it's what David said. This is part about caring for the patient is the enduring part. I think it's what Abraham Vergesi said. Like, can we get technology to help us with that? Like, could we get some of these startup companies to help with some emotional intelligence recognition system. You know, you would be watching the patient and some little, I mean, I'm not, I, I don't know what it would be, but like, can we, um, can we get technology to help us be more patient-centered? Like, not, how can we get better at understanding patients' values and preferences, their emotional needs, in a way that we can implement in practice Without it just, you know, what, what are the technologic facilitators of that? I don't know what they could be. But, I mean, we're very good at creating new technologies. Could we apply them to understanding how to make this part of care better? So that not that we, you know, then we're doing both. We're developing genetic new immunotherapies that are genetically, you know, tailored. But we're also honing this piece that is so important to patients, but that I think we still undervalue. Thank you. Mindy and Dan, I said so maybe. Anyway, I, I think this is an absolutely fascinating um, discussion because it, it hits on many levels. I think one of the things, I, when I hear patient-centered care, I think about two things. I think about one is patients as consumers, okay? And as you were talking about the background of the other, the landmark articles, I was thinking about, you know, our bodies ourselves as a, like, you know, a movement of women to take back their bodies or Elizabeth Kubler-Ross on death and dying. So this is happening in a milieu of both 
narcissism, uh, consumerism, and increasing financial, I mean, the, the big elephant in the room, and it's so funny that David's talking about like these doctor-patient stuff, and I'm talking about economics, <laughs> but you know, I mean, just on a practical level, so much of our care is now a function of whether we actually order certain tests, because that's how we as doctors are graded. Not whether we discuss the test, or like in this case, yeah, it may not be good to have a mammogram or somebody may have a decision why they don't want to do a preventive health care thing. But the fact that patients are consumers, I think, is, um, is problematic because I think it's not like selling lipstick in Macy's, you know, and, and you talked about that a little bit. So I think there's a couple of other things. And the big issue and the other elephant in the room is academic medical centers privilege procedures, technical stuff, highly compensated things. And that's the milieu where we train many medical students, mm -hmm. as well as the whole debt issue. You know, that, that's, there are many things. So I'm intrigued by this. But I think the one thing we need to think about is that this patient-centered care doesn't occur in a vacuum, a medical vacuum. There's a cultural changes that have really so, been you know, like cataclysmic. I'm, I'm glad you raised this, because we have none of the same financial prob issues in Canada, problems in Canada, I was going to say. Um, and we have all of the same issues of communication. I mean, the, we don't have the cost question because patients don't pay out of pocket, but so they're not consumers. Patients in Canada don't consume. But all of these things are just the same. And what's been so interesting to me in doing the Choosing Wisely campaign in all these countries in the world, ranging from Japan and South Korea to Brazil, all the European countries, the Scandinavian countries, choosing wisely and having these, it's the same everywhere. I mean, we have all these different reimbursement systems. The context, you would say, is completely different. But the act of talking to patients about what they value, about working with, it's universal. It's really the essence of being a caregiver in the healthcare system, and it transcends culture. So I don't think it's about the consumer environment. I think it's about, it's influenced by the environment we work, but at its core, it's just about being doctors and patients. Yeah, thanks a lot, Wendy. I, I really appreciate your talk. Um, in terms of, where do I begin? Uh, you know, I think part of, the, as we talked before, the part of the problem is the standard of care, which is, you know, follows this technological imperative in which technology and procedures are, are privileged in terms of, of what doctors do. And I think the standard of care, even though we have different ways of, of reimbursing care all over the world, I think the standard of care has developed, a lot of it has developed in the U.S. and then get permeates the rest of the world. So I think even though they don't follow the same sort of reimbursement system, that the standards that, that we developed here have permeated a lot of what's going on. One of my concerns with patient-centered care now is that I think it's become sort of a marketing slogan for a lot of hospitals. And so, you know, they use, you know, you go to any meeting with administrators and they'll use this patient-centered care thing and they're using it to sort of, you know, as this, as this idea that, you know, for, for selling their care. And so I think that can really take the substance out of what it really was supposed to mean in the first place, which was reaction, I think, to the technological imperative. Um, and also this, the, you know, the surveys they do now, you know, the hospitals are really in, in, you know, they're spending a lot of money on these surveys and we have commercials up now in the hospital. You should go over there and look at the TVs and, you know, they, they, they speak a very corporate response to how to make things better, which mm -hmm. I think may not be working that well. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I agree with many things you said. I mean, I think when hospitals tried to be patient-centered initially, what they meant was timely access to care and parking. I mean, it was sort of the instrumental things and not about what happened in the exam room. Um, it is actually good to be patient-centered if you make parking cheaper and easier, uh, or easier access to getting in the hospital and not having physical barriers. Those are parts of being patient-centered. But I think they never tackled the communication between clinicians and patients, because that was kind of in our world and our culture and our medical education domain. And really, it was hard to tackle that. And a lot of clinicians just weren't very interested in that unless they got patient satisfaction feedback. I mean, how many people in the audience actually get specific, personalized patient satisfaction feedback compared to peers? 
do you, you guys have come? I mean, I think it's good to, I mean, it's helpful potentially to read what our own patients think. What do you think, David? I just wanted to comment, I was actually having a similar thought to Dan's at one point when we had the picture, I think we were talking about the, the press gaining surveys and the checkbox. You know, one of the problems with that is, is sort of everyone gets a vote. And um, not everyone's vote, I think, should count the same. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you check a box and says, you know, I'm a healthy person. I went to go get my whatever checked. It was a minor thing. They were very nice to me. That's a check, OK? Another person, you know, spends three months in the hospital dealing with an incredibly complex problem that changes the life of theirs and their family. And if they survive to answer the survey, <laughs> and if they're educated, you know, and they get mail because mail is even delivered to their house, then they answer, right? But mostly they don't. And so one of the things I worry about, it's much like the measures of quality of care and HEDIS and other things. The, you know, the industry controls these things. And the industry, by that I do not only mean for profit, I mean including professional societies, including, you know, our beloved ABM. And, um, and, and so I really worry that this sort of approach to measurement creates this lowest common denominator phenomenon, mm -hmm. where we're not really getting at what matters ultimately if we can sort of look at ourselves, you know, 100 years from now and what was our experience. So I completely agree. I'll tell you in my experience over all these years, I have a view about what the very best way to improve your doctor-patient, your communication is. And that is to audio tape yourself put a little record, your, your iPhone on, and ask a patient if you could record the visit just so you listen to it after. If you listen to it after, you go, wow, I didn't know I fill in the blank. Didn't know I talked that quickly, didn't know I interrupted the patient, didn't know I um, used so much jargon. The second best, the even better thing is if you can ask permission to play that recording with a, a colleague. Because if you listen, see you, Anna. Um, she's going to her daughter's, uh, to Washington with her daughter, who's testifying in front of the House Judiciary Committee. Right, Mark? <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, if you take that iPhone and you listen with a colleague and you say, I'm trying to improve my communication with patients, and would you listen with me and hear how I, you know, give me some suggestions, those are way better than patient satisfaction surveys. But I, I mean, I, I, I don't know how many physicians are willing to do it. Um, yeah, there's somebody in the back with their hand up. I just wanted to bring up the Fox Moms who started the Heart of Medicine program. So they have a coach. Sorry, the, the Bucks Palm Institute has this Heart of Medicine program that has a woman who's I kind of equate to like an executive coach, but she comes into clinic and observes us seeing patients and provides feedback, both constructive and also pointed out a lot of positive things that I did, which I thought was really valuable to reinforce how I was being patient-centered, but also what I could do to maybe improve it. It's a, I think, real valuable program. So. That's really terrific. So you actually have a person who will come and observe you and give you feedback. I think that's terrific, and I really appreciate you said that she told you what you do well. Because, you know, um, I'd ask the question, how often have you ever been observed when you finish medical school doing what we do day in and day out? You know, Mac Lipkin, who is one of uh, George Engel's um, disciples, used to say that our most common procedure was the medical interview. That, you know, you might do 50 in a week, thousands in a year, an X number of thousands over a lifetime, and yet we never actually get feedback or learn how to hone our this, our most common procedure. So I think it's really neat to hear that you have someone who actually goes in and watches and tells you what you do well. That's really terrific. I was wondering, do doctors feel crunched for time in Canada? Yes. So, Definitely. So, so the difference in the healthcare financing doesn't affect that because that's a, a very non-patient centered thing. Yeah, I mean we're very they're all very crunched for time. Uh, it's you know physicians are still paid fee for service in most settings, not primary care doctors. They're fit, paid um, in a salary. 
but um, uh, specialists are still paid fee for service. And also, um, you know, in very sophisticated areas, there's a shortage of physicians. So they will tell you they have to see a lot of patients because someone could be waiting for a long time for that TAVI. Um, procedure if they don't get to them. So for all kinds of reasons, yes, they're extremely, still extremely pressured for time. Um, so I think all these things are, are true in many cultures. I don't know if you remember this, but the first time I, I met Wendy was in Portland. And, um, and we, we were seeing patients, we were seeing patients together and Wendy had recorded, as I recall, more than a thousand encounters between you and 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 your outpatients. Um, and we did we started a little study about how frequently conflicts emerged between the doctor and the patient using these tape recordings of um, of many many patients. It was an, quite an extraordinary study, but there were so many other studies that followed from that and that, that you, you worked on and, and published on. So it was, a, it was a great experience for me to understand how much information can derive from something like a tape recording of an encounter. Well, I, I can't thank you enough for this lovely talk, and it means so much to us um, as, as we think about the doctor-patient relationship in its evolution and changes in the 21st century. This is really important. Thank you. Thanks for having me.